occur while the system is off, basically, either when it's manufactured or prior to when it becomes operational. And there's a number of reasons why defects are an increasing problem. The fabrication is becoming much more aggressive. Um, the first cell matrix chip we built with two microns CMOS, so your metal layers were um, four microns minimum width. Um, today they're down to like 0.18 microns, I think. Um, so significant uh, decrease, and you're pretty far down in terms of the limits of um, the optical processing, which is using electrons instead of visible light. But you're still getting down to um, where quantum effects are becoming significant. And obviously the whole clean room issue is always um, huge. A typical clean room, I think, is a thousand times more sterile than an operating room. Um, because humans can deal with dirt and dust a lot better than these chips can. Um, so that's, that's pretty uh, telling. Um, there's generally an acceptable loss. Most fabrication lines don't aim for 100% yield. So we try to strike a balance. If you use too much of an aggressive technology, you throw out most of your chips. If, you, um, if you're not aggressive enough, then you're producing stuff that's not cutting edge. And, you don't get the speed on your processor and so on. Um, and there's a general reality in the physical world that, that even nature doesn't create perfection. Um, this is why diamonds are so expensive, because they almost all have defects in them, even though they're developed very slowly under uh, fairly isolated conditions. Um, defects are kind of a reality of the physical world, and um, that creeps up all over the place when you're manufacturing artificial things. Um, so with manufacturing defects, there's also sort of runtime errors. Um, and these can be things such as transients, which, for example, if you have a high energy particle um, come through and hit the gate of a transistor, it can flip the, uh, the state of it, it can temporarily change a zero into a one, it can open or close a gate. And these can create small um, um, transitions in, in a, uh, a value that should be stable otherwise. Um, when transients happen in memory circuits, it's worse because those errors can actually get latched. And so something that is supposed to be a zero temporarily becomes a one if that gets stored in the flip-flop. Um, then that error is sort of permanent until you, you reload the memory. And those are bigger problems, and those are obviously huge problems with something like a reconfigurable device, where what's stored in the memory is actually telling the device what to do at a uh, hardware level. Um, those transients can be, be pretty severe. And they're even worse in the case of, like we talked about the other day, where you have configurations that can possibly short outputs together. Um, a big burst of radiation could flip enough outputs and literally smoke your device. So um, transients can, uh, can be problems in memory circuits. And then there's runtime defects that become permanent in other ways. Um, latch up is a phenomenon in CMOS circuitry where basically um, your power supplies can end up shorted together through your circuitry. And generally, if you power down the circuit and bring it back up, it comes out of that state. Sometimes I think it can actually lead to um, physical damage. Gate rupture is where, um, again, a high energy burst might um, hit an active device like a transistor and actually cause the gate to stop functioning at the gate. Um, metal migration. These metal diameters, they're getting smaller and smaller. I mean, that's how you make a fuse. You get a very, very thin piece of metal. And when you put too much current through it, it melts, basically. The metal atoms move in the direction of the current, and you get an opening. Um, that can be a good thing. Like I say, that's how you make fuses. That's how you make um, uh, one-time programmable uh, reconfigurable devices. They're not reconfigurable, they're configurable, but the old school um, gate arrays, they had just small metal junctions, and you operate these things at five volts, but if you wanted to program them, you put in, say, 24 volts. You go through a programming sequence, and it would basically open up pieces of metal, and that's how you program it. That's how you store it, ones and zeros, to hardwire your configuration. Um, IBM, a number of years ago, actually, had a uh, proposal where they could detect when metal migration was beginning and go into a repair state and basically reverse the current and pull the metal back the other way, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. It's the little ball of metal on the end of the fuse wire with the is always going to the current. I don't know if it's in or against. It depends if you put the current as electrons. But yeah, I think it, well, with a fuse, that's a fairly large 
piece yeah, of metal. It's not so I think it's more melting in the middle. But that actually happens. Yeah. It trace the metal. I think so. Yeah, it does. Because actually, it's less melting that. than actually just moves. Migration. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So if you have, say you're connecting two transistors, and you have some sort of junction, um, it will just, you will have metal moving. Mm -hmm. There's not much you can do about it. Yeah. Other than try to make wider traces, really. Right. Or control the current somehow. Yeah. Yeah, and these are, these are the reasons that engineers make so much money at Intel and stuff, because engineers and physicists and material scientists, and I mean, these are the things that you're dealing with that get you from like a 36 nanometer device to an 18. There are a billion and a half rules there, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, anybody here study any plasma physics? I took a, um, a space weather course a year or two ago, and it was fascinating. Um, and it's very relevant to um, defects and fault handling, so I just wanted to do a couple of slides on this. Um, plasma, it's been called like a fourth state of matter beyond solid liquid gas. It's, um, it's basically a gas, but it's, it's very, very low density. It's almost a vacuum. And it's electrically neutral, but it's composed of electrons and ions. So negative and positive charges just free floating. And in our environment, if there is an ion somewhere, if there's a stray electron, it very quickly finds, is attracted to a particle that's charged oppositely and they recombine. So you don't find free ions and free electrons in our environment. But in a plasma, such as in space, where the density is very low, you may have one particle per cubic meter. These particles can exist for a long time as a single isolated charge and not recombine. Um, there's an example of a plasma in this room they don't generally exist out of space, but yeah, you looked up. Uh, fluorescent tubes actually use the plasma inside. Um, the temperature in those tubes is actually in the hundreds of thousands of degrees, sometimes millions of degrees. Very high temperature, but very low heat. Okay, temperature is the energy that the particles have. Heat is the amount of particles, basically. It's the content. Um, you have a few electrons moving at very high speed. It doesn't feel hot to the touch. But Temperature-wise, the temperature is really, really high. Is this the one thing where the vacuum actually forces the particles apart so that they don't tend not to keep together? I don't think they're being forced apart. I think they're just far enough apart. Um, I think electrical attraction is relatively weak in terms of you know being a meter apart from right. each other. Right. Yeah, so. If they do get close to each other, they would attract, but it's it's relatively uncommon. Yeah. Um, and it turns out to be a very, very different environment from what we're used to um, here on Earth, where we do most of our engineering. Um, the main source of plasma in space is from the solar wind. The sun is, I mean, it's a polar force just on the sun, and it's, it's a really amazing. Um, there's so much going on there that, um, that you just don't think about. Um, but it generates huge numbers of charged particles, and those basically fill the plasma. Um, and the main thing that's, that's interesting is when you look at the energy of a particle versus its mass and velocity, um, ions weigh almost 2,000 times as much as electrons. So if you have an electron and a proton with the same energy, they're going to have very different velocities. Okay, the um, electron is going to move much quicker than the proton. So one thing that was discovered when we started going into space was um, the effect of wakes. So you have a spaceship moving through this plasma. And like a ship in water, there's a space behind it where there's nothing, OK, because it's physically cleared out a path as it moves through this plasma. Um, in that wake, particles will randomly start to move in and out of it okay, and start to fill it back in. But if the electrons are moving much quicker than the protons, that wake's going to be predominantly filled with electrons initially. So your plasma, which is normally neutral, is actually negatively charged in the wake of the spacecraft. And they found out that if you're doing a spacewalk behind the spacecraft, if you get in the shadow between the craft and the sun, you can get really, really negatively charged. Okay, a very, very high negative charge and now you touch the ship with your hand, which is a neutral charge, and you get a spark, 
as far as you can put little pinholes in your gloves. And so, I mean, things like that. Um, this teacher was telling me that basically, um, when this was discovered, you could find entire conferences just dedicated to like the design of gloves and how to deal with this kind of charging problem and uh, different characteristics of, of, um, of plasma flow and a weight. And um, so it's just a very different kind of environment. Um, and it raises lots of interesting challenges. And, and one of the big challenges is, is um, when you're dealing with circuitry. Um, yeah. What about the leading end of the table compression happens? Is there like a state under compression rate and really gas there? It could. Um, I don't know if the density gets high enough. I mean, there'd be some compression in front of the spacecraft. But what is that what happens? I mean, essentially, when you compress a plasma? If you compress it, I think you turn into a gas, yeah. And then what the, the bonds happen? Yeah. Water probably, because these are mostly like hydrogen ions and electrons. I wonder how much uh, velocity you have to have through that to give it enough pressure that it would create. Yeah, I don't know if there's cases where where pressure builds up <coughs> in space and probably like in the formation of stellar bodies. That's one of the things that happens. Um, we never talked about it. It's an interesting question. Electronics in space is a really, really huge problem in terms of, of dealing with faults um, because you get charging of your devices, because you have a um, high radiation environment that you're dealing with. Um, the solar wind itself you know, is injecting particles onto um, your systems in space. And so you get a lot of, of problems with transients, certainly. Um, if you get some problems with latch up um, and gate rupture and some of the higher energy effects. And space is basically one of these areas that's, that people like NASA are very, very interested in how to deal with faults and defects, how to detect them, how to handle them, how to prevent them. Um, one common technique is just plain old hardening. You basically put something around your device and you use a manufacturing process that's just more resistant to radiation bursts or, um, or particle passage. Um, those devices tend to be very expensive and anything that's not going into PCs on your desk is going to be um, not as cutting edge, basically. I mean, the economics, I think, drive the everyday technology, because that's where the market is. That's where you can afford to build a new foundry that costs you a billion dollars to make these chips. So um, the space environment is very challenging in terms of, of defects and faults. Um, detecting faults is sort of the first problem. How do you know when something's gone wrong? And probably the most basic approach is to use voting. Um, run three copies of your circuit and compare the outputs. And if two of them agree and one of them disagrees, you're probably safe assuming the one that disagrees is wrong. Okay, so you're expecting an answer out. You have one and a one and a zero. The answer is probably one. Something went wrong with the zero. Um, that's a very basic um, technique. You can also have some things that are sort of self-checking, like a checksum. Um, you have a stream of data you're transmitting. You add up all the bytes, and you look at the eight least significant bits of that sum, and you transmit that as your last byte. And now when you receive the data, you can do the same thing. Add up all the bytes, look at the last eight bits, see if they match this checksum byte. And if they don't, you know something is wrong in there somewhere. Um, a CRC, cyclic redundancy check, is the same idea. It's just a more sophisticated one. It's harder for wrong data to look correct. Um, the simplest version of this is a parity check, actually, where you just add a ninth bit to an 8-bit number. And you pick a 1 or a 0, so the number of 1s is always even or always odd. And that lets you know if 1 bit flipped, because 2 bits flip. You know, <coughs> it. So you can have different ways that you sort of embed um, self-checks inside the data. Um, Built-in self-test is an idea where you have a circuit that can actually perform some kind of salt analysis. Um, you hit a test pin, and it goes through some diagnostics on its own, basically. Um, handling defects, um, sort of along the same lines as voting, the, the most straightforward way is redundancy. 
have three copies of your circuit and just select the output that is the majority. So two ones and a zero, just take the output of the circuit to be a one. Um, that's easy to do, it's a little expensive because you're spending three times as much hardware as you would for a single circuit. Um, it's also not very fault tolerant because if two of your circuits fail, then you may deliberately be picking the wrong answer. Um, some of the early space missions would use five x redundancy. I mean, really, really expensive when um, when you think how expensive a single computer system was. Having five computers on board, um, economically very infeasible, but it was the best that you could do in some cases. Um, so redundancy is one approach, but it's not it's not going to get you really far. Um, error correction, where you can not only detect an error but actually reverse it somehow. Um, and there's a real common example of that. Yes. Get it? Thank you. 
figure out which spots to avoid, and you go from there. You can do something like this in hardware too. Um, where you have FPGAs, for example, and you know a certain number of them are defective, you can go through ahead of time and figure out which ones are bad and just avoid them. Um, so a Terramac, um, I'm going to get your homework graded over the weekend, by the way. But um, what was the Terramac? It's an HP project where they used um, defective processors. Exactly. Because they thought they'd be more fault tolerant. Yeah. And ended up making something faster than a normal, I forget whether it was a normal PC or. I think it was faster than a, uh, like 100 times faster yeah. than a scalar processor. Um, that's Philip Kikis. Um, he's a very interesting, he's doing some interesting MEMS work these days. Um, one of these people was uh, Stan Williams, I believe. I don't know who the other was. Um, but yeah, Terramac was a project by HP. It was supposed to be a um, parallel processing system based on FPGAs. And they announced it to the world, and they had benchmarks done, and it was running programs significantly faster. And meanwhile, they had patents that they had filed, and they were waiting for those patents to come through. And once the patents issued, they released a headline. I don't know if it was the New York Times or somewhere significant. They released a headline that said, Terramac is broken. <laughs> and what they hadn't told anybody up to that point was that they had deliberately used defective chips um, as a way to demonstrate their ability to handle defects. So when they had these, um, they were custom FPGAs, when they had them manufactured, they told the foundry, don't bother testing them, just give us everything that you make. And they took them and they just put them into the devices and wired them together and started working it. And it was filled with, um, I think, 200 plus thousand defects. Um, and yet it still worked and it worked very well. And it was, um, it was a pretty revolutionary um, announcement that they had done this. So they just built like a large, parallel architecture. Yeah, I'm not very familiar with the architecture, but I think it was basically just a big parallel processor that they could do some, um, you know, configuration on to turn these FPGAs into CPUs effectively. But before they did that, they basically did the scan disk and figure out which ones to avoid. And their architecture was flexible enough that they could um, work around those, those bad devices and um, come up with this functioning parallel machine that functioned really well. So that was, I think, the mid-90s. Um, unfortunately, Terramac didn't survive shipping somewhere. They, uh, HP closed down the project and they shipped it, I think, somewhere in Utah. And when they got it into the lab, it had been damaged and shipped it. The ultimate even. Yeah. yeah, so. <laughs> so that was, that was using a scan disk type approach. Um, and obviously, this is another case where you can draw a lot of inspiration from biology because biological systems are generally extremely fault tolerant, um, defect tolerant. Um, I had an aquarium with a sea star in it once. It didn't look exactly like this, but this was pretty close. And it also had little crabs in it that would like go around and scavenge food and such. And one of these crabs actually. Um, attacked the sea star and um, you can see damage right about here in its arm. Um, and I didn't know what to do for it. Um, my friend and I were sharing a tank and we just kind of decided to see what would happen. Well, the next day the sea star was sitting against the glass of the tank and it was rubbing that spot on its arm with another arm and it just kept rubbing it over and over and over for hours. And my friend said, I think it's taking off its arm. <laughs> and I'm like, no. And as they went on, you know, he'd walk by the tank, he kind of looked at it. And eventually he got to where, like, he just couldn't stop looking. And so we both sat there watching it. And it took off its own arm <laughs> very slowly. And it got through, and that arm just kind of, like, fell off the wall. And it went on with its life. <laughs> okay, that's defect tolerance. That's like, I mean, if, if you had an artificial system that could do something like that, that would be so amazing. Um, and this is just, you know, this is how nature works. So, and it has to work that way because nature is so imperfect in a lot of ways. I mean, 
environment that these things operate on is not temperature controlled, it's not voltage controlled. The food sources, the energy sources are totally all over the place, and yet these things function, we function. So there's some huge lessons to be learned from biology, and we don't know most of them, um, but it's certainly a good place to look when you're trying to find some new approach to um, dealing with an engineering problem. Um, on a cell matrix, um, you can pretty easily implement something like a scan disk. Um, you can access edge cells pretty easily. How do you access the internal cells? I know you know this. Yeah, you go to the edge cells, you build wires, and that will give you access to pretty much any internal cells that you want. Um, if you start from the edge and you work your way inward methodically and you test as you're going, you have the advantage that you know you're only using good cells to build these wires to test further cells. So it sort of heads off the question of, well, what if there's a defect in your fault testing circuitry, which is always a, a big concern. Um, you may have a great circuit for doing some kind of fault handling, but what if there's a fault in that circuit itself? Well, if you're building this up from cells and you're testing those cells ahead of time, you can avoid that problem because you know that you're using cells that you've already tested. And that's one of the advantages of, of self-configurability as opposed to outside configurability. You don't have to worry about what if an error happens in this outside system. And then basically, um, you take a cell that you're gonna test, cell under test, um, you configure it with some particular circuitry, send a test pattern to it, look at the, circuit, the pattern that comes back, compare that to the expected pattern, and if they agree, then it passes that test. If they disagree, then you know there's something wrong with the circuit. Um, you can do all kinds of different tests. You can make a simple echo that just takes in a bit and sends it right back. Okay, it's just a wire that outputs the input, um, and then just send in different patterns. Um, you can make an inverter, which begins to test some of the, <coughs> the other um, uh, bits in the truth table. You can send in a pattern of all ones and all zeros and make sure those come back. That will tell you if there's a bit that's stuck at one or zero. Um, you can send in an alternating pattern, which will tell you if uh, consecutive cells might be shorted together. You can look at how the truth table is actually organized in memory and send in different alternating patterns of ones and zeros to look for other kinds of shorts um, between consecutive rows, for example. Um, and you can get sort of arbitrarily sophisticated in your tests and um, in your test patterns, depending on what you're looking for and depending on what you're going to use the cell for. Um, how do you detect an error in um, Thank you. 
Okay, any idea how to um, how to manage that? Um, 
let me just sort of put another picture of those up. When you have a circuit that, when you have a cell that you know is, is not functioning properly, um, there's a concern that it might go into C mode and start configuring other cells. So there's this notion of a guard wall. side. 
basically you have a set of two cells that are stable, but as soon as you just bump the C input once, the circuit shuts down basically. This truth table will fill with all ones and they'll never be able to be reconfigured. So this is sort of a break-in detector. You build the line of these cells around something critical and you can actually pass data through here using the truth table. It's a slower process, but you can still do it. But if something over here tries to reconfigure any of these cells, this part of the wall totally shuts down and becomes impenetrable to data or to code. Okay, so it's a way to build this piece of circuitry that you need to keep secure. And automatically, if something tries to change that configuration, it gets locked out. And it also destroys whatever information you had in here, which can be useful um, in some cases. So we have that. So like if you set up the second cell. This one? Yeah. Couldn't you set it up to two? Yeah, couldn't you set it up to like when the intruder breaks in? So it's going to on, on every clock tick, it's gonna hoard whatever the, the intruder has with the second cell into the first cell, right? Um there's no worry. Well yeah, yeah. yeah. So it'll hoard those bits together. But Meantime, you could also pass the intruder cell data to the second cell, and the second cell could also be configured to report that data. So you could right. see what the intruder If you wanted to see what was coming through. Yeah, yeah. we will we'll describe it. Sure. Right, that's true. That'd be yeah, um, I think you can only do that for one cycle, though. Yeah. yeah. And after that, you've got all the ones in the truth table. Yeah, you have to capture the Right. Okay, that's, um, that's all I was going to say about defects and faults. Um, were there any questions on that last 30 point homework problem? Okay, I'm going to get those graded over the weekend um, along with the 5.1, and I'll post another 5 point question. Um, and I'll get those up um, that one day. Okay, I'm not going to have class on Monday next week. We'll meet on Wednesday and probably not on Friday. So I think we're going to taper down to um, once a week for a couple of weeks. And um, if you haven't talked to me about projects and you want to do something, 